through the tireless work of modern pioneers. In truly the superpower working on in the fields of pure science to reveal more of the mysteries of the universe. On the surface, it's exactly what it says, which is Black Girls Code. They're learning how to code web pages and code programs for robots. So it's that, in a literal sense. But figuratively, is I think it's a way that we move forward into the future with how we do things, how we innovate, how we bring our essence back to dominant culture. Because right now, our narrative is kind of left out of the story. Just to say the word black girls is revolutionary. Our mission is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. So tonight, it is our honor to introduce the keynote speaker, Ms. Kimberly Bryant. She is the founder and executive director of the Black Girls Code. The Black Girls, the Black Girls Code is a nonprofit organization dedicated to changing the face of technology by introducing girls of color from ages 7 to 17 to the field of technology and computer science with a concentration on, on entrepreneurial concepts. Since 2011, Kimberly has helped Black Girls Code grow from a local organization serving only the Bay Area to an international organization with seven chapters across the U.S. and in Johannesburg, South Africa. Black Girls Code has currently reached over 3,000 students and continues to grow and thrive. In 2013, Kimberly was highlighted by Business Insider on its list of the 25 most influential African Americans in technology and was named um, to the Route 100 and the Ebony Power 100 lists. Also in 2013, Kimberly was invited to the White House as a champion of change for her work in tech inclusion and for her focus on bridging the digital divide for girls of color. Please welcome Kimberly Bryant. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon or this evening. And it's really a, a special treat to have the students um, do the intro. I, did, I didn't know that there were going to be students doing the intro. But I was really excited when I heard the first young man say he was an electrical engineer, because so am I. So I feel like, yes, he is. we are bonded here. And then they're both members of National Society of Black Engineers, so Nesby fam um, as well. So such a pleasure to see students from the university um, with similar interests and perhaps similar experiences of mine. So I wanted to thank them for that wonderful introduction. Um, I also would love to thank Jerry Ann and the whole entire board of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire for giving me this opportunity to speak with you this evening and share a little bit about Black Girls Code, the work we do and who we are and, and why we do this work that we feel is so very important for not only the future of our young people, um, but so very important for the world today. So I, wa I wanted to jump right in. And I want to kind of like dig into this quote by the really, and the famed great American painter and artist, Carrie James Marshall. In this quote, Carrie says, we must come to a certain peace with the past and then be, be singularly focused on the future. So in order to better explain the story of Black Girls Code, and to reveal how our hopes for the future of our girls, or tech divas as we call them, is so very important. I need to take you on a little short trip down memory lane to where the story all began about 40 plus years ago. So this pic the picture that you see here, that's me. And, and yes, Robert, that is circa 1970s. He just didn't believe um, that I was quite that old, and I will take that any day. Um, but I was born in the late 60s and really spent my childhood growing up in the 1970s. 
And this was in the inner city of Memphis, Tennessee. And I always say, you know, that for me, it was a bit of a long shot for a young woman of color growing up at the end of the 60s who'd never seen an engineer anywhere to choose a career in engineering and don a hard hat, steel toe shoes, and go to work every day. I was groomed to be what I would like to say is a girly girl um, in everything that that means. While on the other hand, my older brother was groomed with Legos and chemistry kits. So everything that really would spur your imagination as a young child. And yet my childhood was all pink. It was all glittery. It was all baby dolls. Um, so I like to think it was a bit of a surprise, not only to myself, but for many others around me, that I chose to go to Vanderbilt University in 1985 and major in engineering. Now, when I got to Vanderbilt, it didn't take long for me to recognize that Dorothy was not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> I, it's hard to explain, but going from Memphis, Tennessee, an urban community, and especially at that time, the heart of the civil rights movement, black culture, black identity was on every single corner. It was ingrained in the fabric of the city. Vanderbilt was not like that. Um, it was very much an experience of feeling intense isolation and also feeling very much alone. Because there was only probably about 25 students of color, freshmen, at all on campus. And maybe five in the School of Engineering. Maybe five. And in Electrical Engineering, there was probably only two, upper class and underclassmen. So it was a bit of a shock, a major culture shock for me as a young woman to find myself in this environment. And yet, even with that being the case, when I entered Vanderbilt, that was a peak moment for women in the computer science field. When I started Vanderbilt in 1985, women were receiving about 35% of the bachelor's degrees in computer science. And if we look at the numbers now, that has pivoted drastically. Women, now all women, all races and ethnicities of women receive maybe 12 or 14% of bachelor's degrees in computer science. Yet for black women, that number falls off a cliff. It's about 3% for African American women. And for Latinas, it's less than one. Almost not even on the charts for Native American women. So even though I enter college at a time where by the numbers and statistics, there were supposed to be lots of women in the field. That wasn't the reality of how I felt as a young student entering the university. And think of what it may feel now for young women and men of color when the numbers are less than half. Now, I love Vanderbilt, yes I do, now. But let me just say that the experience for Vanderbilt was very challenging. It was the first time that I can recall as a young woman, a young woman of color in a male-dominated field, that I felt invisible. I remember vividly, very first week of college, going into my very first freshman class. At that time, I was majoring in civil engineering. And sitting in a classroom, and maybe about half the size of this, but with hundreds of students, and the professor asked us all freshmen our first week of class, well, how many of you have taken you know, AP classes and are coming to school with AP credit? The sea of men that I'm sitting in, no one raises their hand, and I look around, and I slowly raise mine. Because not only was I an academic honor student throughout my K through 12 experience, I'd taken not one, but I'd taken several AP classes and came in with many credits. And I waited for a while because the professor did not acknowledge me. Now, I'm quite sure that he saw my little black hand and raised in that sea of numb black hands. Um, I'm sure he saw me, but he didn't respond. He didn't even acknowledge that I had answered the question. And it was the first 
time, but not the only time in that environment that I truly felt invisible. And yet, I persisted. I like to think that I was too stubborn to quit, although many times I really did want to. So imagine my surprise, 18 to 20 plus years later, and this young lady enters my world. This is my daughter, Kai. Now, as you can see from the picture, I had vivid dreams that she would become the next Misty Copeland, even before Misty Copeland even existed. Um, but my daughter had very, very different things in mind. Um, Kai was much more interested in technology. She is what I like to call a digital native. She spent most of her time with Game Boys and Nintendos and Lincoln Logs. And if she had any dolls at all, maybe it was one or two Teletubbies. And as I recall now, I was like, she probably only liked that because it had the little electronic belly. Um, but she was not a girly girl by nature. Um, that wasn't the stuff that interested her. And so by the time she got into middle school, I decided, okay, if you're gonna spend all this time on technology, I want you to be productive. And I enrolled her in the summer program at Stanford University. She was only about 10. And it was at that moment in that summer experience where her life, as well as mine, and the lives of many other girls changed. When she went to this class at Stanford, she wanted at that time just to be a video game tester. This was her life's ambition. And the reason she wanted to be a video game tester is because she'd get all the games first and for free. And, and this was what she had as her career ambition. But after spending five days at Stanford learning how to build these games, I remember when I went to pick her up, she, I was nervous, I was like, I don't know how this is gonna be, but she ran down the steps, she was excited, and she started to immediately tell me about all the things that she had learned during the summer camp experience that week. And as we drove home, I remember her saying that, you know, now I don't want to be a video game tester, I really want to be a video game developer. And I was like, fantastic, maybe I can get this kid out of my house. <laughs> um, and it was just really amazing to see how in such a short period of time, her whole world concept and perception of what she could do and become, it expanded, it exploded. I was elated. Now, as we drove, if you know the Bay Area, Stanford is in Palo Alto, so we had to drive up to San Francisco to get back to where we live. It's a bit of a drive, and we talked about the things that she learned in class. During the conversation, she said uh, one thing that was life-changing for us both. She said, Mom, you know, I really did like this class. I, I learned a lot, but you know, sometimes the, the instructors, they didn't really pay that much attention to the girls. And that's the moment that my heart sank to the bottom of the car. Because I realized that I had gone in that classroom with all the other parents to look at all the things that the students had built during the week, and I didn't even pay attention to the fact that there were just a handful of girls in the classroom. All the rest of the students, 35 plus 40 students, were boys. And out of all of those 35, 40 students, Kai was the only student of color, black, white, or any ethnicity. And I was horrified because I knew at that moment we had more than a shared experience of blood. We had a shared experience of being invisible. And I didn't want that for my daughter. And at that moment, I knew that if she was destined to follow in my footsteps, I wanted that to be a safer, an easier, and perhaps a warmer, more welcoming path than the one that I had been following for the past 30 years. And that was really the moment that this vision and the seed of an idea for Black Girls Code really began. Now, after we left that class in the summer camp, I started to really talk to people all around about what I thought the world could look like for girls like Kai and girls like myself. And many people said, well, you know, girls are just really not interested in technology. They don't like to do these things. 
but the numbers prove them wrong. So as I mentioned, the numbers of students earning bachelor's degrees in computer science has drastically changed from the time I went to school and graduated in the late 80s. But if you look at a, a scope of girls today, over 50% of middle school girls say they have an interest in computer science. But something happens between middle school and high school and that number drops drastically. So by the time they're in high school, less than 2% still maintain that same interest in a STEM career. That is what we wanted to change the dynamics around the Black Girls Code. We wanted to really address the statistics and identify what was causing girls to drop out of the funnel, either voluntarily or involuntarily, before they even got a chance to get to the launching pad. I wanted to really here spend a little time on a few more very critical statistics to, so that you can understand what we're dealing with in terms of the numbers. So in 2015, there were 500,000 computing jobs available to only 40,000 new computer science grads. Yet only 4% of African Americans receive engineering degrees. 26% of engineering degrees are given to, given to African Americans went to women. Yet black women represent a mere 2% of the STEM workforce. So even though we graduate African-American engineers at a decent rate, women don't make it to the workforce in engineering roles. This is what we're trying to address with the work that we're doing with Black Girls Code. We want to reverse these trends and really change the dynamic of what a computer scientist looks like. Our vision with BGC is to encourage girls of color to embrace this current technology marketplace as both builders and creators and to give them exposure and access so that they can obtain and not only obtain but create some of the 1.4 million computing jobs expected in the U.S. by the year 2020. Now we do this in many ways. Our program is primarily chapter based. We have chapters all over the U.S and we focus on introducing them to everything that the tech world has to offer. So that includes web design, robotics, mobile app development, game development, even virtual reality and artificial intelligence. We understand that by giving them access and exposure to many different fields, one of those fields will spur a niche as well as an interest in a girl to take it further, go into deeper and more in-depth study that will hopefully inevitably end up in the tech field as a leader. Now, when we started Black Girls Code, we were, it was 2011, there have been many organizations that have created programs to teach kids to code. And yet, we remain one of the only ones with a singular and pointed focus on girls of color. Our vision is to teach one million girls to code by the year 2040 and as we like to say, become the de facto Girl Scouts of technology. Now, since we started in BGC in 2011, we've seen the organization grow exponentially. We have 14 chapters across the US. We have one chapter in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we've actually taught over 9,000 girls to code. I need to update that bio. And we engage over 105,000 tech volunteers per, per year. And yet still there's more work to be, do, to be done. We believe part of the lack of inclusion in the tech industry is driven by the absence of a robust pipeline of girls of color entering tech fields. And this begins much sooner than when they get to college. If we wait until they get to college, it is too late to get girls of color engaged in most fields of STEM. We found several ways that we can address this, and we have sought to make sure our program engages our girls in ways that allows us to interrupt this leakage from this pipeline and the funnel into college before they get to that critical point in their academic career. A study was done by Google in 2014 called Women Who Choose CS. 
and it identified four influencing factors for whether or not young women decide to pursue a CS degree. BGC has ensured that all of our programs focus in all of these areas. The very first one that I wanted to talk about a bit is social encouragement, or this concept that positive reinforcement from either family, peers, or mentors is a critical factor for engaging girls at a point that it allows them to continue to be successful in a STEM study, and particularly in technology. One of the ways we do that is from those pools of 1,500 volunteers that come into BGC from tech companies in all of the different cities and where we have chapters and programs engaging. This picture shows volunteers from a hackathon we did um, just about a month ago in San Francisco. With about 200 girls from all over the Bay Area, we even had girls that flew in from Texas as far away from Florida for this two and a half day event. And the volunteers were there for many of the companies that the products that we use today, from Google to Facebook to Adobe, et cetera. And the bond that is created in those moments, not just in this hackathon, but in all the events, is critical not only for the girls that are engaging with these mentors, but for the mentors themselves. Because it does more than just teach the girls a skill. It allows us not only to, it changes the perception of that tech worker who goes then back into an environment such as a Google or Facebook with only 1% because he sees the capacity of the girls to engage in this rigorous study. And it, I want to say that it negates this common theory of folks like James Damore who think women are not capable of being computer scientists. One of the stories from the volunteers at the last hackathon that touched me greatly was a volunteer, um, a young white male volunteer who mentioned that he was coaching this team of girls. And he was really impressed by everything that they were being able to do and their dedication during the course of the hackathon. And he told one of the girls, you know, I'm gonna be here tomorrow and you know, I'm gonna be here every day that you need me because I wanna help you get to the finish line. And the young student said to the volunteer, you are gonna make me cry because no one has ever told me that they would be there for me until I got across the finish line. And uh, I think it was critical in that moment, both for the volunteer, he said in a breakout, you know, I'm sitting in the back of the room doing the breakout. He said it, I'm like back here wiping tears away. <laughs> Because, you know, it was clear that it wasn't, this program wasn't just for the girls. The volunteers were making an impact with these students in a way that went beyond just teaching them how to do a JavaScript website or how to, you know, build a robot. It goes through this level of encouragement and getting it from a place, an unlikely source that they don't usually get on a day-to-day -day basis in the course of their work with their schools and their communities. One of the things that this volunteer, another volunteer said was this quote here from one of the classes. I could have never anticipated how captivating it was going to be to witness a room full of young ladies that were committed and eager to learn how to code. It goes to show how significantly special the work BGC is doing. I think more individuals need to experience it. Now, not only is encouragement from these mentors critical to what the girls are doing in the classes. Parents, both mom and dads, are a key part of the program. And they not only bring their girls to class, sometimes, as you see here, they coat right alongside them. Um, one of the stories that I love to share is about one of our students, Rebecca, who started with Black Girls Code in 2013. She's a part of a, a single parent household. She has a mom who's a rental agent who found out her daughter had an interest much like mine in computer science and decided to enroll her in Black Girls Code. So not only did Rebecca find her place in this place where she thrived around this interest that she had in, uh, like my daughter Kai, in video game development, she came to every single class, every single class for years and years and years. 
So last year, as she started to really become advanced, she started to do workshops outside of BGC. They'd been gone for a while, and they came back after you know a bit of being an absence from the program. And I'm like, where have you guys been? You know, we've been missing you. And they're like, oh well, you know, we decided to take these classes on Ruby and Rails and Java together. So you know, we've been actually going to these classes at Girl Develop It and Women Who Code and learning how to build things together. So not only was Rebecca finding her niche in terms of being a computer technologist, she was possibly planting a seed that would change the whole financial trajectory of her family, including her mom. That's the story that we love the most to see in terms of the work that we do with Black Girls Code is not only how it has an impact on the student, but how it has the potential to impact entire communities and families. And Next, um, one of the things that I love most about the work that we do with Black Girls Code is how it impacts our girls and our students. I want to stay here and go back to here for a minute. Uh, let me see how I can make it stay. Um, a student said, when she went to Black Girls Code, I felt like I was part of a group and part of a team. I can't get to stay. I don't really feel that way at school except for a few friends. I felt well, I, I was part of a family or something special. One of the things that is most beautiful within Black Girls Code is this concept of peer encouragement and engagement. It is vitally important that these girls see a community of their peers that have the same interests, some of the same skill sets, and just some of the same unique life experiences as they do. It gives them a space in which they may rarely see in school, rarely achieve to be free, to be accepted, and even to find their tribe, so to speak. I had an interesting conversation recently with a colleague who runs a similar program that does not specifically focus on girls of color. And she mentioned, well, you know, in our program, it has girls of all kinds in it. And that's really what the classroom of the future is going to look like. And I really thought about this a lot after that conversation um, and what it meant to create this environment that was perhaps monogamous in a way that really centered women and girls of color. And it occurred to me that we're not trying to replicate the classroom because when we look at traditional K through 12 education, we find that girls of color are traditionally victimized, they're stigmatized, they are brutalized in traditional school systems. Our goal is to create a safe space, a safe place for them to be free, a place where they are told that they are brilliant, a place that they are told that they are capable. And we feel that if we create this environment now, they have time because they have to eventually go into the world. But the work we're focusing on with Black Girls Code is creating, is focused on creating self-confidence and self-efficacy so that when they do encounter these prejudices or these racial differences as they go out into society, they'll know they already have everything they need to succeed. Thank you. The next concept and factor is self-perception. A key objective of BGC is to redefine this common narrative of who you think of when you think of a computer scientist. This is one of our students participating in another hackathon where they're really focusing on issues relevant to them in their communities and becoming problem solvers as well as technologists in the work that they do. Through these workshops, our girls begin to see themselves as creators. A research study was done back in 2014 by Frederick Smith and John McArdle, and it's called Ethnic and Gender Differences in Science Education. And what they found is that African Americans in general colleges have a high level of interest in STEM, but they lose interest and take a different path, especially women, primarily due to self-concept. So our focus in these workshops is to create a different dynamic for our girls, to really address this issue of lack of self-confidence, 
because we know that issues and factors of gender and racial perception and discrimination, learning and education environments with, which perpetuate negative stereotypes leading to stereotype threat will continue to persist for years and years. Our goal is to equip our girls with the tools to combat and overcome these challenges that they will inevitably see in these school environments. And eventually, to become leaders and mentors themselves. Well, these are some of our alumni. One of them who is at Phillips Exeter um, now, is she's the second year student there. Uh, one who is one of our interns from Black Girls Code who just graduated last year with a degree in computer science from Spelman College. is now working at Microsoft. And even another who is an aspiring high school student in New York who's been doing um, hackathons as well as intense computer study because one of the girls in Exeter is actually her mentor. Uh, so it pays it forward. So we see our girls not only being able to create opportunities for themselves, but to pay it back in a continuous cycle that allows them to become the leaders within their own peer groups. The third key influencing factor, and perhaps the most obvious, is academic exposure. We find that girls need an opportunity to participate, especially girls of color, in structured learning opportunities, which allow them to address the skills that they're missing in their school environments with a group of their peers. Studies show that many girls and students of color are still grossly underrepresented in STEM classes within their schools, and they receive most of their exposure to tech and computer science in after-school programs such as BGC and others. It allows them the ability to explore, create, and innovate in a safe and supportive environment. And last but not least, the fourth key factor, which we really focus on heavily within Black Girls Code, is this concept of career perception. We feel it's vitally important within Black Girls Code to present a familiarity with others who are doing similar things in their careers that are representative of the, of the girls in their communities. Through our workshops and classes, we demystify the field of CS and create culturally relevant experiences which show connections to their communities and to their culture. Uh, one of the things that we do most focus on is this concept from a parent. It's empowerful for girls to actually see people that look like them doing things that they perhaps will address in their future pathways because they know that it's possible. So part of the work that we're doing is making sure they understand the possibilities by seeing someone that has already been in the same, uh, maybe perhaps community, grew up in the same place, and looks maybe like their mother, their aunt, their sister, who's also a leader in the field of tech. Because then they know the steps are not new for them, stuff that we have passed in our ancestors' way, and they can also follow. So we find that these students thrive when they have access to students, instructors, professionals who both look like them, speak the same language, and have shared cultural experiences. A recent study by the Ascend Foundation found that the number of black women in, tech, in the tech workforce actually declined by 15% from 2007 to 2015. Now, I've talked a lot about the work that we do within Black Girls Code, and there are others that are doing this work as well. And yet, the numbers continue to decline. We have found with our work and our research and the, uh, the partners that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, that there continue to persist discrepancies and biases in recruitment, in hiring, in promotion, and in visibility and access and opportunity, which continue to plague the tech industry, but fall hardest on women, and especially women of color. One of the things that we find with the work is that we carry a lot of the load of changing the industry on the side of both educators and nonprofits. Now we feel that work needs to be done by companies who do need to change their policies, who need to change their environments. So not only that they recruit 
girls that are coming in from our funnel, but they are able to keep them engaged, allow them to thrive, and actually allow them to survive in these often harsh and critical corporate environments. And even though we see these dire statistics, I continue to be very encouraged by stories of our students and stories of their success. A growing body of research suggests that designing STEM programming and curriculum that focuses on addressing issues such as prior experience, confidence, and sense of fit would increase the number of African American girls in STEM. This picture shows three of our girls who continue to inspire me by what they are able to achieve and the level of excellence they are able to incorporate through their STEM studies. These are girls like who've been like us from the beginning, including my daughter Kai, who is on the end there from the first picture, who's now 18. These girls have gone from knowing very little about coding to building apps of their own, to winning hackathons, or even like my daughter Kai, to be named one of Team Vogue's 20 under 20 as she prepares to continue her career in coding. For each one of these girls shown here, they've gone from wanting to work in a tech company to planning to be the owners of one. Every single one of them. So in this way, we continue to be reminded that BGC is about so much more than just teaching these girls how to code. Our goal is to teach them self-confidence, to teach them a sense of self, to teach them resiliency, and to teach them how to lead. When I think about the work that we've done with BGC, our current success reminds me of one of those Saturdays six years ago in 2011, when we started the organization. Tiny seed of an organization with only six girls in a tiny basement lab in Bayview Hunters Point. So out of these six girls, one of them being my daughter, who really had no choice but to be there. <laughs> they would come in every Saturday. Every single Saturday, they would come in. Now, they ranged from as young as six to about 10. And we really didn't know if they were going to come back every Saturday for six weeks and you know, take this time out of their Saturday to come and sit in a computer lab in a basement, but they did. And so one Saturday we said, OK, we're going to do a test today. Instead of just telling them everything to do in this lesson, we're going to make it a challenge. And so this challenge was that they had to create this game. It was a game about like a racetrack. And they were going to have to code this game in order to get the racetrack from the beginning, the race car from the beginning of the track all the way to the end of the obstacle course. And we would give them little clues or little sections of code, but the rest, it was up to them to figure it out. Now, when we gave this, uh, this assignment, they all went over to their computers and they started to play around a little bit. And then they would ask us questions. Well, like, we don't really know what to do next. Like, what, what can we, what can you tell us? And we're like, no, we got clues up. You got to figure it out. Come the clues over there on the board. Go, you can figure it out on your own. And they slowly began to get it. And one by one, they would code a little bit, get a little bit further down the racetrack, and then they would start to run to the other front of the room to get the next code because nobody wanted to be the last one to finish this game. Until finally, not, it didn't take them that long. All of them were able to complete this coding challenge that day. And they all got to the end of the racetrack and they all figured it out. It, you know, you could see by the light in their eyes and how they were excited about what they were able to figure out on their own that we had achieved something special. That's when we knew we taught them so much more than the coding lesson we intended for that day. We taught them this concept that's going to go much further for them as women of color in the world as they grow and mature in the day-to-day -day journey. We taught them how to push through. And see, this ability to push through, this is all so very different 
than Sheryl Sandberg's um, theory of leaning in. Because sometimes, as a black girl or woman in a male-dominated space, we have to ramp it up a bit, find some internal motivation, and push through. Thank you. Thank you very much.